Can I tell you the story about how a boy with a gun charge picked me up and slammed me into the ground and how it propelled me to working with over 200 system-involved youth over the last three years? System-involved youth refers to kids in the juvenile justice system, those who have been incarcerated, arrested, or placed on a diversion program. It's been on this journey I've had the opportunity to work with over 100 children at the local juvenile detention center. I've received referrals to work with over 150 kids on probation. I have spent countless hours tracking kids down, some who neither have phones nor homes, and I have been in hospital rooms with kids who have been shot. I have mourned the loss of life for some of my students because of gun violence. In the same way, I have spent time with kids in adult prison who are facing years of incarceration. And I have been to many courtrooms advocating for their lives. For some of them, I'm a father figure. To others, I'm a mentor, a brother, or a friend. To some, I'm downright annoying. I am pesky like a fly that they just can't seem to swat away. <laughs> I'll take what I can get. But to one boy in particular, I was an obstacle to get thrown to the ground. This child came to me with over 200 hours community service and two years in and out of residential programming for a gun and burglary charge. He had been stripped from his home, his family, and all of his comforts. He was the first ever system-involved youth I had the opportunity to work with, and the moment he tackled me to the ground, he was this close to being the only one. <laughs> but when a youth fights, flights, or freezes, we can't ask, what's wrong with you? We must ask, what has happened to you? Today, I've come to tell a better story, to advocate on the behalf of these children who represent over 500,000 delinquent cases, to the over 25,000 youth in residential programs who have been stripped away from all that they know, and to the over 2,000 children in adult prison. I have come to humanize those we tend to demonize. Because when I see the stories of some of my students begin to circulate on social media, I tend to go and see what people are saying about them. From one of the most toxic places in the world, the Facebook comment section. <laughs> I see comments like, lock that kid up and throw away the key. I see comments like, I hope they charge them as an adult to the fullest extent of the law. And I see a ton of racial slurs aimed at children, even though the news article doesn't say the child's ethnicity or shows a picture of the child. Could you imagine that instead of saying, let's lock those thugs and criminals up, we asked, how can we help those kids get out? I have the opportunity to work with many kids who are in the system, and I believe that the system is unfair. And one of the most unfair parts of the system is that of the status offender. A status offender is a youth who is on probation, which is a post-prison supervision, and can now, create, can now have a crime that wouldn't be a crime if they were an adult. So I have youth with petty charges like smoking, vaping, or drinking, who violate their probation. They get a pickup order against them, which is a fancy word for a warrant, get arrested and placed in the back of a police car in handcuffs, and in some cases are incarcerated for up to 21 days. Their crime, they're a status offender because they didn't show up to an online class. Was there an investigation to see if the child had working Wi-Fi? No, and he didn't. Did they bother to check if the child had a working computer? No, and he didn't. What about the boy I worked with that went into the juvenile detention center for 14 days? Why? Because he was a status offender. His crime? Running away from an abusive home. We live in a world where a child can be slapped with the term delinquent for running away from a home without investigating why the child ran away in the first place. I have a boy who stole an iPhone charger, and because of multiple status offenses, he has been in the system for multiple years, that he has become used to it. He has become institutionalized. Let's be clear, these crimes do not make youth criminal, but it puts kids in a system that is criminal. Do you remember when you were a kid? Do you remember the struggles you had as a child or as a teenager? I want you to picture with me that you were stepping in the shoes of a system-involved youth. 
many whom who have been stripped away from their home, their rooms, their toys, their comforts, their family, their friends, and their pets. Some of them who are incarcerated have missed birthdays, they've missed funerals, and they even missed, in some cases, the birth of their own children. Hmm. Could you imagine the things that they go through? System-involved youth have many things in common. Some of them is that they have no trusted adults in their lives. Some, that they have no community support. Or, they belong to schools with little to no resources for the needs that they have. And on top of that, they struggle with things like homelessness and food insecurity. They struggle with chronic poverty. They struggle with gang activity and incarcerated family members and loved ones. They struggle with abuse and neglect. They struggle with substance abuse and addiction. Could you survive, let alone thrive, one day in their shoes? I have another question for you. What are the two entities that create the most space for system-involved youth? The answer, prisons and morgues. Incarceration does not lower the recidivism rate. Recidivism is the return to prison either because of a new conviction or a violation of probation, remember that post-prison supervision within three years. Researchers studied data from 39 states and the results were haunting. In some areas, the recidivism rate was as high as 80% of youth offenders had reoffended within three years. What about morgues? One of the leading causes of death for 11 to 24 year old incarcerated people is suicide. And in some areas, incarcerated youth that are in confinement are two to three times more likely to take their lives than those in the general population. When a youth enters into the system, their chances of getting out of the system drop drastically. And that those youth that live within the system oftentimes tend to die in the system. If you want to create space for a youth to succeed, You've got to find them where they're at. So how do we help our kids? How do we help these children get out of these systems? I believe the answer is to create spaces for them to succeed. There's an African proverb that goes that the child that is not embraced by the village will burn it down to feel its warmth. I'm going to be honest with you. I did not like that quote when I first heard it. And so I worked with the young lady, the little girl, with a DUI. She was rejected for her crime. As we dove deeper into her story, we began to realize that she was grieving the death of a parent. The same parent who wanted to make a woman out of her by having her be his getaway driver for his violent and murderous crime sprees. This child did not need incarceration. She needed intervention. Or what about the boy that I witnessed get put in the back of a police car in handcuffs for bringing a knife to school to kill himself? And instead of being viewed as a kid coming to school in crisis, he was welcomed with 10 officers with guns drawn because they were told he was a threat. His crime? Not wanting to live in a public place. Or what about the boy that I visit that is in the adult prison? He has been in the system since he was 11 and in adult prison since he was 16. I am the only visitor that he has. So I tend to get the questions like, hey, Carlos, should I take this plea that will keep me in jail until I'm 23? No child should have to make those decisions. So yeah, maybe the village needs to burn down so that a newer and safer village can take its place. Because if we do not rebuild the village, prisons and morgues will continue to embrace our children. If you want to write the future of your, your community, it's by creating spaces for youth to not just survive, but to thrive. Now imagine you are with a system-involved youth. The natural instinct is to think they need incarceration. 
but I believe the focus needs to be on intervention. I've received over 150 referrals to work with kids at the juvenile probation office because of the work that I do in diversionary programming. I firmly believe that when a system-involved youth has a community around them, they are more likely to succeed. In fact, I will go as far as to say that the single best intervention for a system-involved youth is one stable, trusted, caring adult. The good news is I'm looking at a room full of people. Could you imagine if we all worked together for the better of these youth? Could you imagine if we created more teen centers for kids to be a kid? Or what if we provided more affordable and accessible mental health or substance abuse counseling? What if we all mentored one kid within the system? Or what if we crowd surfed together to provide more grants, to provide more resources for these kids before they get in the system? And if these stories aren't moving enough, let's talk about the dollar. The average community program, which is proven to lower the recidivism rate, as well as have more than one youth at a time, costs about $75 a day. That's $27,000 a year. On the flip side, in some areas, the average cost to keep one youth incarcerated for a day is anywhere between $274 and $1,370 for one kid for one day. That's anywhere between $100,000 to $500,000 for one kid per year. The prison industry costs taxpayers billions of dollars each year. The difference? Incarceration oftentimes leads to more incarceration, but creating spaces allows youth an avenue to succeed, and it writes a better future for our community. And can I tell you something? It works. You can ask the kid who tackled me right into the ground. You remember the one with the gun charge and the burglary charge? That was three years ago. He was told by the powers that be that he would either spend the rest of his life in the system or that he would die. It's prisons and morgues, am I right? I have the honor to say that he not only excelled in our community, but he got off probation, he got off hard drugs, and he has not been rearrested. A month ago, he came up to me and he gave me a big hug. And he said, if it wasn't for you all, I would be dead. It takes a village. So if you want to write the future of our community, if you want to change a dystopia into a utopia, it is not by looking at what's wrong and punishing it. It is at looking at those who are in most need and resourcing those needs. We can do this, but only if we rebuild the village together. Thank you.